thank you, Ken. It's a pleasure to be back here at the Puni at the uh, Builder Center, uh, organized by Mauricio, and to talk about Brazil again with you people here. Uh, as Ken said, things happen every day in Brazil. Uh, yesterday, the Supreme Court decided to indict Senator Ayesu Nevi, and he's become a, an accused at the Supreme Court. So now there's heavy pressure on Geraldo Alckmin, the former governor of Sao Paulo, and now the president of the PSDB, and pre-candidate for president of the PSDB to expel Navis from the party. And the commentary, the commentary is that, well, when Je Tasso Gerisace, PSDB senator from Ceará, was president of the PSDB back in 2006, when we had what was called the ambulance scandal or the Sanguisuga scandal, he immediately expelled three uh, politicians from the PSDB because of these accusations. So as Ken said, there's always something new in Brazil. It, the only difference is that our president does not do tweets. <laughs> okay. Well, first, I'd like to do a little bit of a background for you about what's been happening in Brazil since 1985. That's when our, our 21 years of military rule ended. In January 85, Tom Credit and Son Sarney were elected president and vice president by the Electoral College. On March 15th, uh, Tom Credit took ill, and Sarney was sworn in as vice president. Then on the 21st of April, Tom Credit died, and Sarney then became uh, official president for the rest of the term. In 87, 88, we had a National Constituent Assembly, which wrote our new 88 Constitution. We had direct elections for president the first time since 1960 and 1989, and Fernando Collor was elected, defeating Lula on the second round. Collor was impeached back in 92, and Itamar Franco took over for the rest of the, that, that term. In 1984, Fernando Henrique Cardoso was the finance minister, and they organized what was called the Real Plan, and that helped elect Cardozo on the first round. Cardozo was then re-elected in 98 on the first round. And then in the next election for president, 2002, Lula defeated Sam on the second round. And Lula again in 2006 defeated Alchemy, the same Alchemy I just mentioned, on the second round. In, 1980, in 2005, we had the Mensa Loan scandal, uh, which some of you probably remember. And in 2010, Brazil had extremely high GDP growth, 7.3. And Lula, in 2010, signed the Ficha Limpo Law, which had been passed by Congress in June 2010, <coughs> in response to a, a, a popular initiative by the voters. Uh, in 2010, Dilma defeated José Serra in the second round, and it was virtually elected by Lula because the Mexican said he did a dead dasu and chose her as the PT candidate for president. In 2013, Joe signed a new plea bargaining law. As you all know, plea bargaining is a real old mechanism here in the U.S., but only was officially determined as a legal procedure in 2013. So that's somewhat ironic that she signed this legislation. Then in 2014, Joma defeated ISU Navis on the second round. The same ISU Navis I just said was indicted as a, a accused at the Supreme Court. In 2014, Lava Jato investigation began, investigating corruptions, especially in Petrobras. The Lula and Joma government almost succeeded in destroying Petrobras. In 2015 and 16, Brazil went into very, very deep economic recession. For those two years, a total of minus six GDP. We're still trying to get our, work our way out of that hole. In 2016, the Supreme Court, STF, uh, began, uh, said that you could begin your prison term after you have been convicted at a second level court. Before this decision, we had a concept called trans de julgat, which meant that you would only you would be presumed innocent and only would have to go to jail after a final ultimate decision by the Supreme Court, which meant if you had lots of money for good lawyers, you might put your, your, your jail term off for 15 or 20 years. 
So this was a big change in our judicial procedures in Brazil. In May 2016, Dilma uh, Rousseff's impeachment uh, began. She was suspended from the presidency. And then Vice President Michel Temer assumed the presidency. And finally, in August of 2016, she was impeached by the Senate. And then Temer became our president. Uh, in October 2016, we had municipal elections. And the PT elected less than half of the number of mayors it had elected back in 2012. In 2017, the general prosecutor, PGR, made two accusations against Temer, which had to be deliberated by the chamber of deputies, and he was uh, not sent to the Supreme Court for judgment. Uh, in the September of 2017, Lula was convicted by a first-level court of corruption involving uh, bribes coming from Petrobras contracts. In January this year, he was convicted. His conviction was upheld by the regional court, the second level court in Porto Alegre, the TRF 4. And in April 2018, the 7th of April, uh, Lula began serving his 12 year prison sentence. Uh, and also in 2018, the same general prosecutor, who is now a woman, uh, began a third investigation of corruption, corrupt practices by President Temer. So that's sort of an overview back then. We had, we had deadlines just recently. The 4th of April, the Supreme Court rejected the obvious corpus for Lula. On the 7th of April, the party switching window, 30 day party switching window closed. Also on the 7th of April, uh, the, the limit for stepping down or resigning your executive position uh, to run for office was that limit. And six governors stepped down to run for either president or governor. Also on the 7th of April was when Lula was in prison. Finally. Uh, this is the latest data for a poll, which was published last Sunday. And the, the poll was, was conducted on the 11th through the, between 11th and 13th of April uh, last week. So as you can see, in January, Lula had 37% and dropped down to, to 31, and had a rejection level currently of 40%. Jacques Wagner, in the simulation of Lula No in April, had, had only 2% as a possible replacement for, uh, for Lula. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro, who is a former military officer, is, is running second and increased his preference from the two polls from 10 to, uh, to 15 percent. Marina Silva, who had run for president twice before, she was steady at 10 percent. Uh, Joaquin Barbosa, and some of you may know who Joaquin is, he's the first Afro-Brazilian to serve on the Supreme Court and uh, is going to be the presidential candidate of the PSB. He came in with, uh, with up from 3 to 8 percent. Geraldo Alchemy from Sao Paulo, PSDB candidate, dropped down from 7 to 6, and is sort of stagnant in the polls. Alvaro Diaz from the Podemos, he's a senator from Paraná, 3 percent. Maria Davila from the PS, PC to B, the Communist Party of Brazil, 2 percent. Fernando Collor, some of you remember him, of course. Uh, he's PTC, he's also running for president, and he's down now to 1%. Rodrigo Maia, the Chamber of Deputies president, is a pre-candidate for the Democrats, and he has 1%. Minelli is the former finance minister, 1%. And Flavio Rocha, who is the owner of the Hedges, he has uh, uh, retail chain in Brazil, 1%. But the, the data for you did a comparison, as you can see. Lula, yes, Lula, no. So in the Lula, no, uh, uh, Lula was not on the, the simulation. So uh, we then have to look at how these, these changes occurred without Lula. Who picks up the Lula voters? Ciro Gomes did the best, plus plus seven from five to 12. Marina Silva, 10 to 16, six, six points. 
Alchemy picked up five points. Bolsonaro, imagine, some Lula voters, without Lula said they would vote for Bolsonaro. Four uh, percent, Alvaro Diaz four, four points. Caller two, and Manuel Davila one point. These are the three, 13, I would call them major or more important pre-candidates for the presidency. We have to say pre-candidates because the parties only hold their conventions in late June, early July, and then register their candidates as official candidates for president. So we, we call all these people pre-candidates. Alvaro Gias, uh, the Podem, Dr. Foy said he had 3%, and he had, his party has 17 deputies. Ciro Gomez, 5%, with 20 deputies. Fernando Qualler, PTC, 1%, no deputies. Flavio Hosha, PRB, 1%, also has 20 deputies in his party. Alchemy, PSB, 6%, with 40, 49 deputies. Medellis is MDB, uh, which used to be PMDB, but now it's MDB, uh, 1%, with 50, two deputies. Joaquin Barboza, as I said before, the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, 8%, his party has 27 deputies. Lula PT had come in with 31% and has 58 deputies. Manuela Davila, PC2B, 1%, 11 deputies. Marina Silva, 10%, but only two deputies in her party. Uh, Paulo Javier de Castro, who's a PSC candidate, his party has eight, de eight deputies. Maya from the Democrats, 1%, and his party has 44 deputies. I, I, I pointed out that Marina Silva only has two deputies in her party. The minimum for you being allowed to participate in TV, debates on TV, is five deputies. So in principle, she would not be invited to any televised debates. These are the other, what I call minor, or in Portuguese we call non-eco candidates. Afif Domingos of the PSD, Aldo Hebel, who used to be in the PC2B. Last year he switched to the PSB, and when Joaquin Barbosa became the PSB candidate, he was somewhat turned off, and switched to the SD, Solidarity Dutch. MIL has been a candidate for president already three or four times, PSDC. Gary Bolos, PSOL. Bolos is the head of the MTST, the, the, uh, the ruthless homeless movement in Sao Paulo. Uh, Jean Meret, who is a businessman in the Novo Party. Jean Vicente Goulart, who is the son of Jean Goulart, is in the PPL Party. Levi Fedex, who has been candidate three or four times for president, PT, PRTB. Valerio Monteiro, former journalist, PM, PMN and Beta Lucia, the PSTU. So as you can see, we're coming very close to the 22 candidates we had for president back in 1989. I'm not sure whether all these people are going to be officially registered as candidates in early July or not. This year we have 47 retired military, well, officers who are pre-candidates. One for president, who is Bolsonaro, four for governors, two running for the Senate, and 40 running for deputy, either state or federal deputy. People had asked me, well, back in the last election in 2014, how many retired military were candidates? But I, I don't remember, I don't have that information. So I don't know if this is more or less than before. This is sort of what I, I'm describing to you, Lula's pilgrimage, or his Via Crucis. He was first candidate for PT candidate for governor in Sao Paulo in 82. Then he was elected deputy to the Constituent Assembly in 86. He was candidate for president in 89, 94, and 98, and was finally elected president in 2002, 2006. In 2016, he almost became uh, Dilma's chief of staff, but that was vetoed by Jomar Mendes, <laughs> judge on the Supreme Court. He was convicted in the first level federal court in 2017, and in January this year in the second level court. On 4th of April, the Supreme Court denied his obvious corpus, and on the 7th of April, he was arrested and imprisoned. So we 
question whether his candidacy is going to be compromised or not. We have the Fischer Limpo law, which was adopted back in 2010, saying that if you have been convicted in a second level court, you are ineligible to run for office. So many people think this will be applied to Lula, and he will not be a presidential candidate. The, PF, the PT has gone into sort of a decline. As I mentioned before, in 2012, the party elected 655 mayors. But two years ago, in 2016, elected only 254 mayors, 39% of what they elected back in 2012. So in Brazil, we have more or less a rule of thumb that if your party elects more mayors, two years later, you're going to elect more deputies. If your party elects less mayors, that means that two years from now, your party probably will elect less deputies. So that means that in 2014, the PT elected 68 deputies. So that might mean that in 2018, the party might only elect something like 26 deputies. We call it the same rule for 39%. In 2015, the PT had 10 senators. In 2018, some of these senators, we may, the PT may only elect three or four senators. Several of the current senators whose eight-year term is up are not going to run for re-election, but are going to run for federal deputy instead. The PT in 2014 elected five governors. Almost all of those are under accusations and prosecution at the STJ. So probably the party will only elect three or four governors. That's more or less what I'm predicting. Party switching. <laughs> this shows you all of the, the parties and how many deputies they elected in 2014, how many they had in March last month, and how many they had after the party switching window closed. Uh, I'm not going to run down all of the, the numbers, but this is more or less the result of the party migration. And this is very important because it now determines the distribution of the party election fund, which is over three billion hay ice, to the parties, depending on how many deputies they had after the party switching window closed. So the winners were the Democrats with Maya, they picked up 11 deputies. The PSL with Bolsonaro picked up six. Pros, which is one of the parties supporting Ciro Gomes, picked up five. The PR got four. And Podemos, also the Jesus party, picked up one. That's the net result. They might have lost one or two. Podemos, for example, might have lost two and picked up three. So net, the net gain was one. Uh, losers, the PSB, Barbosa's party, lost seven. The MDB, uh, Mideli's party, and also Temer's party, lost six. The SD, Solidarity Dodge, lost four. PHS, the Human Humanist Socialist Party, lost three. And the PSC, Habella's party, lost two. PSDB? Excuse me? PSDB? Uh, I, well, let's look back. You're a good, good question. PSDB, number three. Uh, they went from 48 to 49, so they picked up one. But that, I wasn't considering that a major gain or loss, so I didn't put that in the table. David, as timekeeper, you are at 14 minutes. Okay, it'll be maybe another five minutes. Um, what I'm going to do now is describe the principal candidates. Lula, politic, does politics in Sao Paulo, a metal worker, age 72, was a national labor union leader, as we said, as I showed you before, candidate for governor in 82 in Sao Paulo, mm -hmm. Constituent Assembly, 86, no, wrong, 86. Uh, president, ran for president three times and was elected president, 82, 86. In 2018, he declined in the polls, as we saw back uh, uh, before, from 37 to 31. Quite strong still in the north and the northeast, but quite weak in the south. Whether the Fischer Lipa law will be applied to him, we're not sure. Who might be his replacement and when? And would that replacement have time to campaign or not? Uh, without Lula, because of the Fischer Limpa law, uh, who will get Lula's voters? As we looked back before, null and blank was, was a large difference, 23% null and blank without Lula. Ciro Gomes, Marina Silva, and Bolsonaro picked up the most of Lula's voters. 
in the simulation without Lula. <coughs> Alchemy, Geraldo Alchemy, governor of Sao Paulo, former governor of Sao Paulo. He's a medical doctor, age 62, was city council member, then mayor of his home city, state deputy, federal deputy, vice governor, and governor. His nickname is Piccolo de Chuchu. You all probably know Chuchu is a popular uh, water a squash in Brazil, and pickle there means popsicle, a shoo shoo popsicle, that's his derogatory nickname. He was defeated for president by Lula in 2006 and got less votes on the second round than he got on the first round. Bolsonaro leads the polls in the state of Sao Paulo, which is extraordinary. This guy's been two term governor, he was in governor twice before, and Bolsonaro comes into Sao Paulo and picks up more support than Governor Alchemy has. He was elected the PSDB national president. He has, and his, his associates in Sao Paulo have some fairly severe accusations of corruption at the STJ. And now that he's out of office, his case drops down into the first level federal court to be, to be prosecuted. A stagnant candidate, six, seven to six percent of the polls, he has a pro-reform agenda. Now, some PSDB leaders currently would like to replace Alchemy with Jean Doria and convince Alchemy to run for, for the Senate and then support Marcio France, who is the current governor of PSDB, governor of Sao Paulo, plus Alchemy's vice governor, and for governor. We'll have to wait and see whether that's going to happen or not. Because of his vacillation regarding ISU Navis, not expelling him immediately from the party, is contributing to his, you might say, lack of charisma or lack of incisive uh, performance or behavior. Bolsonaro. Jair Bolsonaro is a retired military officer, age 65, had discipline problems in the Army, <laughs> and was, was accused of, let's say, discipline problems, but was absolved by the Superior Military Court in 19. 88. They went into the reserve, was elected to the city council of Rio in 88, and then served at, he's now in his sixth term as federal deputy since 1990. Rio city council to federal deputy. What parties has he been associated with? First, PDC, then PP, PPR, PPB, <laughs> PTV, PFL, PP, PS, and PSL. Not in the PSDB. <laughs> Uh, he runs second in the polls right now at 15%, seen as a, a far-right candidate and ahead of Alchemy, as I said before, in the Sao Paulo poll. He is an anti-Lula candidate. And so if Lula is not a candidate, he's going to lose most of his platform, which has been anti-Lula. He has no positions of any real import on social and political questions. He has a very, the military, the current military has a very negative view of him because of his disciplinary problems when he was a, an officer. And he attracts what in Brazil we call alienated voters. Ciro Gomes did politics in Ceará, age 61, the lawyer. His party went from Arena, PDS, PDS PMDB, PSDB, PPS, PSB, Cross and now PDT. PDT is a party that Leonel Brizola founded back in, uh, in 1980. He was mayor, state deputy, governor, <coughs> finance minister, and then minister of national integration under, under Lula. He did an internship at Harvard in 90, 95 through 97 and was a presidential candidate in 98 and 2002, 12% each time. He recently switched to the PDT, invited by President Lupi, national president of the PDT, to be the presidential candidate. And between January and April, his polls dropped down from seven to five. He is a very bad, loud mouth and very erratic behavior. He tried to attract Lula voters, but only ended up with 7%. He is hopeful that the PT will do a coalition to support him for president, but most of the PD, PT leadership is very negative regarding Ciro Gomes. Marina Silva. 
Marina does politics in the state of Acre. She's age 60. She was a disciple and protege of Chico Mendes, who was the main defender of rubber tappers in this region. As you know, he was assassinated, murdered, uh, trying to protect rubber tappers. She has a B in history and was a Kuchi leader in Acre, joined the PT in 85. In 86, no, in 88, she was elected city council in Hill Branco. Then in 1990, was elected state deputy and 94, elected senator, re-elected in 2002. In 2002, Rule appointed her to be his environment minister. In 2008, she resigned the ministry because she was in great conflict with Juma Hussef, who was Lula's chief of staff. And so she resigned the ministry and became a candidate, presidential candidate for the PV, the Green Party, 19%. She quickly realized that the, this PV was not very green, except this kind of green. And so she uh, went into the PSB and as the vice presidential candidate of Eduardo Campos, who was killed in an airplane crash in 2014, she became their presidential candidate, 20%. In September 2016, finally, her party, the Hedge de Sustentabilidade, the Sustainable Network, was registered as a party. In 2018, she's become a pre-candidate again, but is steady at 10%. There is a rumor or a version or a, uh, let's say, an idea in Brazil of a, pop of a possible coalition between the PSB with uh, Joaquim Barbosa and Marina Silva, and she would become his vice presidential candidate, which I called the odd, would call the odd couple. <laughs> and her head, she has only two deputies, as I mentioned before. Timekeeper notes you're in 25 minutes. Oh, okay. Um, just just two, one, one or two more minutes. Rodrigo Maia, uh, been in politics in Rio, age 48, born in Santiago, Chile, but is considered a native-born Brazilian because his father, Cesar Maia, was in exile in Chile. And he was registered at the Brazilian consulate in Santiago, which is considered Brazilian property. So more or less, he's considered a native-born Brazilian and can be a candidate for president. Uh, a nice way out. <clears throat> Cesar Maia uh, was uh, exiled in Chile. He's the Democrats pre-candidate for president. His father said to him, better get yourself reelected as federal deputy and then reelected as chamber president than trying to run for president, which you probably will lose. <laughs> that was his father's advice. <clears throat> he was first elected federal deputy in 19, 1998 and reelected 2002, 2006, 2010, and 2014. He was elected chamber president in 2016 after Eduardo Cunha was arrested and jailed with the Lava Jato. He was re-elected chamber president in 2017 and launched as the, the uh, pre-candidate of the, of the Democrats. Well, only 1%. And as we saw before, his party picked up 11 new deputies. <coughs> Alvaro Gias, politics in Paraná, age 73. He has a BA in history and has been a radio announcer. His party sequence was MDB, PMDB, PST, PP, PSDB, uh, then PDT, PSDB again, PV, and now Podemos. He was city council member in Londrina, state deputy, senator, governor, and now senator, elected four times senator. He was defeated for governor in 94 and 2002, and his Podemos party, has a, a, he has 3% of the preference in the poll. Joaquin Barbosa, this is the last slide. Joaquin uh, was former judge on the Supreme Court. He's now age six. 63. He was judged between 2003 and 2014, appointed by Lula. Uh, he was a reporter on all the cases of corruption in the Mensa Loan scandal and was president of the Supreme Court 2012-2014. He was the first Afro-Brazilian, or he is the first and only Afro-Brazilian to, to serve on the Supreme Court. While he was going to law school at the University of Brasilia, he worked as a, a Oficial de Gabinete, the lowest level bureaucratic position within the, the Foreign Office, Itamarachi. Finished his BA at uh, UNB in 79, then he got his PhD in law at Paris II in, 2000, in, in 1993, and then became a federal prosecutor. He was a visiting professor at Columbia, 
and also at UCLA. In 2018, finally, he joined the PSB and is their pre-candidate for president. His polling went up from 3 to 8 percent. A, po a possible coalition with Marina Silva, as I said before, the odd couple, and that ticket between, <coughs> between Barbosa and Marina was some 18 percent, ahead of the current poll showing of Bolsonaro. So I thank you very much, and that's my presentation. Thank you, David. Our next presenter will be Georgie Alves. We're going to hold questions till the end, and then we will take them. So. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again. When I was talking to Ken a little earlier, I started coming to the Hildner Center when I was a graduate student. It's been a little while. Um, I'm glad to, to still be here. Um, it's a good place to come and have good conversations about Brazil. So. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how the Northeastern vote fits into this, right? I mean, why are we talking about the Northeastern uh, vote other than the fact that, that that's what I know? Um, it's not just that. It's also because it's incredibly relevant. So the Northeastern region, one of the five political regions of Brazil, it's about, you know, it houses about 56 million people. So, you know, that's about, you know, a little bit over a quarter of Brazilians. Um, Generally, presidents historically that have won have taken the Northeastern vote, and they've taken it by a lot. So, the, you know, if you go back even to the mid '90s, whoever wins the Northeast carries like 45 million votes. That's about, you know, it's about 35 to 40 percent of their entire vote. Um, and one thing that's changed. One thing that's changed. Um, <coughs> you know, from the 1990s to now, and qualitatively what people have argued that caused some of the victories for Lula, is that between Lula's first election in 2002, so basically the way to interpret this map is the redder these little chunks are, these are municipalities, the, the more the net margin for vote for Lula, historically the PT, that's not where it won elections, right? Its constituency was in the South and the Southeast. Ties to labor, or civil society organizations, things like that. And the Northeast is not where it was. Um, but by the time Lula was reelected, there you go. There was a migration. So basically, what happened, and the scholarship has shown this for quite a while, is that the PTs, the, the PTs migrated to the Northeast. So it went from a situation where you know the adage in Brazil was poor people don't vote for poor people, um, to yes, poor people vote for poor people very much. Um, and they like it um, when they get served policies that help them. So to give you an idea, I'm going to zero in here just on the Northeastern vote. And look at what's going to happen. So there's going to be, um, depending on, on positive or negative connotations, a good or a bad infection. Um, but what is going to happen? So in 98, Lula lost to Fernando Henrique Cardoso. By 2002, this is the vote share per municipality, right? voting for Lula. Um, and then eventually, what's going to happen is a migration. So if before the PT didn't count on the Northeast to win anything, now it's going to depend on it increasingly. And this is going to work its way through the Juma years, both Juma years at the year where they depended on them the most. It was almost 48 million votes. So this is significant. So this is the share, for example, of the votes that elect PT presidents that come from the Northeast, that yellow chunk or the golden chunk. Relatively speaking, that increases. And this also moves subnationally. So the share of PT elected representatives for the Chamber of Deputies, the Chamber of Deputados, but also state deputies and mayors also increase. How can we predict how Northeasterns vote, therefore, right? So one of the things is the PT migrated there. The PT is in trouble. Um, can the PT count on Northeastern voters like they were doing up to fairly recently? Um, and the answer is it depends. Because really, the argument that, you know, that comes up in my scholarship, what, what Northeastern states really and Northeastern voters really, really like is a good incumbent. So basically, northeastern states, though not all of them, are relatively dependent on federal transfers. 
So the way that you run a state that doesn't have a, a large economic base where you can tax yourself is to run your state government and to run your municipal governments, what you do is that you rely on the spigot of federal transfers, which is not unlike some states here in the United States as well that are net receivers of, of federal transfers, right? Um, so what really matters is, you know, let me figure out who's the, who the boss is. And there's a supply and a demand thing. You get coaxed into joining these alliances, but also people line up willingly. So historically what's happened, look, let me show you. So what this is showing you is, this is counting nine Northeastern governors. And basically, whenever you get the, the dark part of this chart here, it's they're the same party as the president. Either on the right, right? So this here is the right. Oh, you can't see my uh, pointer there. Um, parties in the right. Oh, that doesn't show anything. Sorry. Um, and then parties in the left. So historically, what Northeastern voters and Northeastern governors really like is to be lined up with the head honcho. And they'll do that if they can. Now, the thing is, you don't always know who the head honcho is going to be. Sometimes it's very predictable. Sometimes it's not. For example, in, 19, in the 1989, 1990 election of Finland Caller, um, it wasn't clear. So his party didn't elect any governors. But as soon as they knew who it was, everybody then jumped bandwagon to join the coalition. The other period of where nobody really knew what was going to happen is 2002, where Lula was powerful enough, uh, enough to win, but it wasn't really clear how big his coattails were going to be. So they weren't. So the PT, for example, elected just one governor in the Northeast, but it was its first governor in the Northeast. Now, if they can, notice what happens. Once they could leverage federal government, you know, access to resources, ministries, um, you know, channeling of resources, legally, illegally, um, everybody joins the party, right? So they jump from here, they jump from there. That's an abrupt change that's happening in one electoral cycle, and it stays. Okay, so what's gonna happen in the Northeastern vote? Normally you'd say, well, they're gonna go with whoever the incumbent is. But what's unique about this electoral cycle is the power of incumbency at the federal level has been pretty much destroyed. Right? It's been destroyed, or okay, uh, David doesn't like destroyed, but it's been significantly weakened. Right? That's for a couple of things. First of all, economic contraction, even though which has dried the spigot of resources though now the economy is a little bit on the rebound. And the fallout of the Lava Jato scam, right, which have hindered, you know, not only the PT, but also President Tamer, even though he escaped, but he was hurt by this, and many people in his cabinet. So if you don't believe me that incumbency wasn't at least a little bit hurt by this, let me show you something. These are the Q ratings for Michel Temer, right? And what the red line is, is the, the people who classify the government as bad or, for the lack of a technical term, horrible. Terrible. <laughs> terrible. Right? We're terrible. Um, and that's historic. To have a, a president, and a, a, you know, a president that's that unpopular, and they stay, um, and to give you an idea of what that means, right? So what this chart is showing you is that historically for Brazil, sorry, this is very, very low, their approval ratings. Much lower than Temer. Well, well, you know, that's any other Much president. Maybe Trump. you have to go back to Kohler at the worst, right? And to be that low. Much better than Trump. Much lower than no. Trump. Absolutely. Yeah. Trump, Trump has what, somewhere around 40% depending yes. on who you ask. Much worse than Trump. Yeah. And if you compare Brazil to other countries, Right, so 32 countries, 7,000 plus opinion polls. Timmer's approval ratings are historically bad, comparatively bad. So that means that the ability to then shovel resources and transfer votes through coattails to the Northeast is weakened, severely weakened. <coughs> Who's popular in the Northeast? This guy. <laughs> right, so this is 
part of Lula's caravan through Brazil that he started last year, um, where he started, of course, in the Northeast, to go back into the hands of the, of the povo, uh, the povo nordestino that loves him. Um, and he started by going, you know, he got on a bus and he went around in a bunch of different states. Of course, he spent a little bit more time in the places where the PT also had a governor because they treated him nice. But disproportionately, Northeasterns were out to see Lula. You know, his approval ratings in certain parts of the Northeast, for example, in Pernambuco, it's 65%. You know, Lula, Dilma, other PT candidates, they needed a second round to become president nationally. But if they were to depend just on the Northeast, they wouldn't have needed it. Some places, you know, voted up to 90% to Lula, some municipalities. They're incredibly popular there, especially in the hinterlands of the Northeast. Right? So the, the, so the question is, you know, and if you want to compare how popular that is to, you know, what happened to Lula when he tried the same thing in the South, um, uh -huh. he got egged and he got shot at. Even though that's the historical base. By the way, that figure there is pointing at a bullet hole. Um, Lula was not on the bus, of course. Um, but, you know, there are some doubts as to who fired Yeah, and then there's, you know, they shoot it themselves, you know, like whatever. I mean, that's different than this. Of course. Absolutely. Right? So the question is, you know, can Lula win? Okay, yes. Apparently, right? So David talked about this. Even though he's, he's suffered a dip since being arrested, he still commands about a third of the Brazilian vote. And disproportionately, that's concentrated in the Northeast. Now, if Lula can't win, or can't run, <coughs> who's going to get it? Can he transfer that to somebody else or not? Can he touch, right, with his magic touch and transfer his votes to Ciro Gomes, for example? Um, which, so far, he hasn't really been able, willing to do. Or Jacques Wagner, former governor of Bahia from the PT, but who was, you know, Lula didn't really name or didn't really do anything about that. So, um, so the question is, who's going to get transferred to? And we don't know. We don't know that. But given that, I want to say something. So we don't know who's going to be president of Brazil. You know, Jairo Nicolau, who's a, who's a political scientist in Brazil, uh, known for knowing a lot about polling, congressional elections, and things like that. He says it's the most fragmented election since redemocratization, even more so than 1989. He says you could predict the front runners in 1989, 200 days out, 100 days out, however many days we are from the election. We can't do it now. Nobody can. Any of these, you know, I tried to put together a little pie chart of, of the different candidates. I had to color out some of them because there's so many that was visual pollution. <laughs> like, you don't know. They have 30 different possibilities. Um, so we can't predict that. But what I'm going to tell you is that we can't predict what's going to happen subnationally. Right? So the power of incumbency story that I'm telling kind of goes like this. Um, if you've got a powerful president, things are going decently well. The president gets to squeeze that down and force channel resources and therefore make some allies in the governor's seat. And if you can do that, then the next thing you do is that the governor has power over the outcome for mayors. Now, if the president is missing, or that power of that incumbency has been weakened, then it's going to be a game of governors. So the question is, all right, so is the PT going to do well, decently well, is it going to die? Well, it's always tough to, to, to prognosticate, to, to, to kind of try to tell the truth of the future. But what I think is, the PT is going to do fine where it has incumbent governors. That's three states in the Northeast. Right? It's Ceará, it's Piauí, it's Bahia. In the other places, I don't think it's going to be very well, do very well at all. It's going to have to hold on. And I, I think it's going to be punished severely. So to give you an example, um, if you look at the mayoral uh, election results, and Dave talked about this a little bit, the PT took a walloping in terms of the number of mayors that they had. Right, so this is the good part of the story, still going up. This happens in between general elections, right? Goes up, 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 and then they go down. They go down by almost half. But the losses, actually, the, the places where it held on are concentrated. 
in the states where they had the governor, they were able to weather this storm. They were able to hold the fort down. And if anything, and if I can find my slide, um, what happens is the PT is more dependent on northeastern states than it's ever been before. So this is not presidential vote. This is the number of PT mayors for all of Brazil, and what that yellow part is, is the share that's in the northeastern states where the PT has governed. So the PT is acuado, in other words, like they've been backed up into the corner, but they have these, they've learned to play incumbency politics. And I think in, in the lack of a powerful president to squeeze them out, like Lula squeezed out a bunch of other people, um, I think that they're going to stay. And I'm going to give you one example. And that's the battle for the governor of Bahia. Right, so here you have a representative, new but of the old elite. This is Antonio Carlos Magalhães Neto. He's the grandson of Antonio Carlos Magalhães, who was the former leader of the political machine in Bahia that ruled Bahia, give and take, for 20 years. Um, and on the left of your screen here is the current governor of Bahia, Rui Costa, who is from the big day. So Rui Costa has lost his big ally, right? Jim Rousseff and, and the entire machine behind the federal government that gave him back in. Um, but he is still controlling the government of Bahia and therefore a big, relatively big purse compared to most municipalities. Both of these people are actually very well, um, their Q ratings are very high. So Wasemi Neto is approved by 70% of the population of Salvador, the capital of Bahia. Rui Costa is about um, what is it? 65%. So they're both popular. And they were going against each other. The old versus the new. The new that's the old and the new that became old, I don't know. <laughs> right? And so if you go, if you look at Salvador, election year, as Brazilians know, is the time to get stuff. That's when roads get paved. That's when hospitals get filled. I see him in It's not running. Oh, well, we'll get to that. But everybody was gearing up to this showdown. Is the PT going to stay? Is the, are they the new? Or is the old power shaped as new going to take over Bahia again? So I was just in Bahia last week. And you'd be amazed. This was right before he chose not to run. Um, but the city is prepared. It's dressed for a nice electoral competition. So everywhere you go, there's billboards by the government of the state and the city municipal government. I don't know how often you see the city of New York buying gigantic billboards across the city, but in Brazil, that's fairly common, right? And here's one of the big, oh, you know, I got so much money, I bought two of the billboards and I stretched it across. <laughs> and what this is doing is saying, imagine Salvador without the largest or the second largest public hospital. And you know, you, you even got the, the, the pensive guy there saying, you know, it probably wouldn't be so good. And then it says, the government of the state of Bahia has changed Salvador. We have worked here more so than your mayor. Another big thing that they finally got going after 20 plus years is the, is the very beginnings of a subway system. They took over that, right? And they were able to finally finish it, or they will finish it before the election. <laughs> But it's already running, and they, of course, have billboards all over. Now, in the meantime, you know, the city of Salvador can't do as much. But they also have a bunch of stuff sitting around like, you know, nobody's ever done as much for our city as we have. We've just repaved the largest, you know, highway, freeway in the town. You know, stuff like this is everywhere. We've built the first municipal hospital in the history of the city. <clears throat> right, so showdown was on. Showdown was on, man. And then everybody got surprised because if you looked at the few opinion polls that we had for Bahia, so this is all the incumbent governors who can run for re-election. And the green bar there is the you know, voting intentions to vote for the incumbent. For the most part, the incumbents are way ahead. But in the case of Bahia right here, they were not. So I said, I mean, that was ahead. Right? So the return to the old party of the political right, the old ways of doing things, um, with a new face. But guess what? With a 15%, 15 point lead, David already spoiled the ending. Um, <laughs> Antonio Carlos Magalhães Neto chose not to run. 
He didn't step down. Right, because to, to run, he would have to step down um, as mayor of the city of Solondo. So he said one of those beautiful things politicians say, yeah, I want to spend time with my family. No, no, no. He said, um, I want to honor the, honor the voters, the pledge that I made to the voters of the city of Salvador. Blah, 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 blah. <coughs> so somebody with a 15-point lead and with the heritage or the pedigree of the, you know, the most powerful political family in the state, with the lead, chose not to, not to test, right? to not test the PT governor, even though the PT is incredibly unpopular in lots of places. But it's a story of two things. First, the PT still controls the government, so the machine, you'd call it, in Bahia. So they've got money to spend, and they're going to do it until the court says that they can't do it anymore, they can't inaugurate any more things. <laughs> and then the other thing is, he couldn't get the allies to defect. The reason why the PT was able to govern in Bahia, and this comes from some of my research and some of my research with Wendy Hunter as well, um, is that they were able to win because they made alliances with some interesting people. They broke with their history of not mixing with the political, you know, the, the everybody. Um, before they were very picky with their alliances and then they opened up to try to win. So this guy here is Jadel Vieira Lima, one of the elites in Bahia who ran the PMDB, and then he basically did a little quid pro quo where he didn't run for governor, allowing the PT to unite the elites, unite the clans, and defeat uh, the, the party on the right, the damn, the PFL, with the, the Cajalistas, right? Um, in return, he got to be a minister in Lula's cabinet. And he got to take these nice photo ops and control funding that he then channeled to all his favorite municipalities. He's being audited for that, by the way. Um, now, the thing is, that guy, I don't know how many of you follow Brazilian politics closely, um, got famous for another reason. <laughs> Last year, he, got, he became even more famous or infamous for the fact that he had 51 million AIs. That's about $16.5 million hidden in an apartment in the city of Solomon. <laughs> Nobody's ever been able to say it's what police, it's for. Federal police photo. Yeah, the federal police yeah, took this photo. His fingerprints were all over it, too, so there's <laughs> nothing they can do. Right? So the way that the PT won this was by making deals with these kinds of allies. They basically channeled resources to them, and then they got them to jump ship the most opportunist of politicians, right? Especially at the local level. Um, and basically, these people need to be fed. They're hungry, and they need to be fed. And then the moment is that it came to, you know, I mean, that was looking around saying, hey, you guys used to hang out with my grandfather. We go way back. You came to my first communion. Let's go. It's time to go again. They said, eh. You know, if, if maybe Maya was over there and you guys have kicked out Tamar and I knew for sure you had somebody, that, a trump card that you could play, um, but I don't know. And I'm not going to trade what I know for sure, that Hood Costa has the money of the government in Bahia and he's going to give me a cabinet post for the chance to go on an adventure with you and get screwed out of this. You right? so, he used to play on with a trump card. Well, I, did, I guess it wasn't, I didn't mean to, but there it goes. Um, <laughs> So the end of the story is this. Incumbency is incredibly powerful. Even so that somebody that has lineage, that supposedly have these, these ideological you know, connections to these other parties in the center and the right, wasn't able to pry their old allies away from their new PT masters. So my prediction for the way that the Northeast vote's going to go, I can't tell you who they're going to go to in terms of the president. But I do think that the PT is going to reelect the three governors that they have. And I think that incumbents will do fine, those that can run. In the states that they can't run, three or four, then it's a crapshoot. That's what I think is going to happen. So even though it's a, it's, it's a turbulent year in Brazilian politics, I think we still can know things. And I'm putting my, you know, going out on a limb here to be really embarrassed if this doesn't work. But I'm not going to be shy of trying. I believe, I believe in this stuff, right? So I think three PT governors get reelected. And I think other incumbents get reelected too, especially because there's not a president to interfere. And then, you know, the PT will, will wither more in the states that they don't have governors because they can't control this stuff. 
And that's it. That's my bit. Thank you very much, Georgi. Uh, now, Viviani Luporini from the Federal University of Rio and from Columbia University right now will give us an, uh, an economist's view of the situation of Brazil. Well, we're in the midst of uh, very high political turmoil in Brazil, right? As you could see from their presentation, we have about 20 candidates running for uh, pre-candidates running uh, for presidents, uh, for presidency, and uh, several polit political parties. We can, I cannot even name them. There are so many. <laughs> um, but what I, I would like to focus is on some actually hard facts of uh, the economic situation of Brazil that will have to be faced by, by the elected government, be it from the right, from the center, or from the left. Well, what we have here is the primary expenditure of the central government is a percentage of GDP. And uh, this is, uh, the central government means the treasury, the, the central bank, and um, and uh, the treasurer of the central bank. Um, and social security. And social security, thank you. And what we see here is that expenditures actually increased, have been increasing, uh, have been increasing 4.7% uh, over GDP between 1991 and 2016, while GDP itself has been increasing 2.5% over the same period, okay? So what we have is like a continuous increasing in primary expenditures of the central government uh, that has, left a, that has uh, less a decade. Uh, it, just a reminder, the primary expenditure means uh, expenditures except financing of the public debt, okay? And, uh, we have, in order to cope with this, we, well, the, the, government, the governments have approved like two pieces of legislation. Uh, the, the fiscal responsibility law that was approved in 2000, in the year 2000, and uh, the new fiscal regime, which is a constitutional amendment, number 95, that was approved in 2016. Uh, it's, uh, the fiscal responsibility law um, is a very detailed piece of legislation that uh, dictates how the budget's going to be constructed and how it's going to be implemented and followed. So uh, it requires, for example, that every two months, the government has to uh, give explanations and give, give accounting of what's been happening with this, its projections of revenues and the, the the sequence of expenditures and adjustments have to be made so that so that the fiscal targets can be um, achieved. And the new fiscal regime was approved in 2016. It's actually actually an expenditure rule, uh, which says that the the primary expenditure, the, the law, the fiscal uh, responsibility law applies to all all levels of government. The the new fiscal regime. It's an expenditure rule, applies only to the federal government. And it says that, uh, it, it says that the, the, the primary expenditures cannot grow more than inflation. Uh, the increase that you can have in, in primary expenditures uh, is going to be up to the rate of inflation observed until the previous June. Because a new, a new budget law has to be proposed by August. So in, in the previous June, they'll have the, the, they'll have the inflation rate measured by the consumer price index, the ample consumer price index. And, and the, the expenditures can only grow by that amount. That means that in real terms, that means discounting inflation, in real terms, ex primary expenditures will stay the same. 
the objective of that would be to have, as, as GDP grows, you would have a decline of expenditures over GDP over time. And these two pieces of legislation uh, set the, the basis for fiscal policy in Brazil. And whoever it is that's going to run Brazil from uh, 2019 on will have to deal with this. Okay. In particular, uh, the, the expenditure rule, the new fiscal regime, is going to be particularly troublesome for the next president. <coughs> uh, here we have revenue, net revenue. Uh, I'm, I'm plotting here net revenue because it, that's actually the, the, the amount of resources that the federal government has on its hand. Uh, it's like total revenue, excluding transfers, fiscal transfers that uh, Georgia was mentioning before. So the net revenue is what the federal government actually has to run its business. And what we see here, which is uh, kind of interesting, is that for a long time, revenues follow expenditures. And, but after, after 2011, this pattern changed drastically. And we, we had we have uh, expenditures rising as a percent of GDP and net revenue fall. And the reason for that is we have in the, the budget, Brazilian budget is very rigid in terms of expenditures. Uh, if we add payroll and social security, and that's what I mean by social security is just the, the regime general. Uh, I'm not including the special regime for the public sector, for, from the public servants or the military, just the, just the, our regular social security. Right, private sector. The private sector, yeah, the social security. Uh, if you add the payroll and social security, we, we end up with 73% of government outlets. And, and we had a big recession, so it's a rigid budget over a big recession you have a rise in the expenditures of GDP. At the same time, the same recession made the, the net revenue fall this much. Okay. Uh, as a result of the fiscal deterioration, a, a strong deterioration of, um, of the fiscal stance of the Brazilian government, we had a simply ballooned Death, the, the debt. This is the gross general government debt. By general government, I mean it's included the federal government, the states and municipalities, as well as external debt and uh, public enterprises, everything we do. And it's just unbelievable that the, the debt increased about 20% over GDP in four years. It's just unbelievable. And of course, this is not a benign trajectory. And something has to be done to stop it, or to even, even to turn the trajectory, or to at least stabilize it. And I made a, like a back of envelope calculation of how much would be the effort, fiscal effort, that the government would have to make in order to stabilize the, the, the public debt, the gross public debt, at 75%. Uh, one, just one, one more thing. Uh, here, the, the, the Brazilian government official statistics for the debt does not include, does not count um, tra uh, securities at the central bank as part of the debt. Uh, and the official, the, the international statistics that, uh, do include that. So the, the, the debt by international um, uh, sources, if you look at the IMF, or the World Bank, will have, you'll see the, the Brazilian debt over 80%. And if you, see, if you look at the Brazilian statistics, it's going to be around 75. Okay. Uh, so what I made, uh, like a back of envelope calculation of what would be the, the, the fiscal effort required to stabilize the deficit, the, the, the debt, I'm sorry, on 75% of GDP. And uh, I got some scenarios here. Um, I got the GDP growth projections by the World Bank uh, on 2% for 2018, 2.3, and 2.5. And I got here the neutral 
rate, inter uh, the real interest rate. The neutral interest rate would be uh, the rate at which um, you, you, the economy can grow without inflation. Okay. Usually the advanced economies uh, make this, this calculation uh, as an average of the, the real interest rate over 10, over 10 years, last 10 years. Uh, in Brazil, we use, we, we use several measures and we make a, an average of five years. And this neutral rate, according to the central bank, is 5%, okay? uh, real interest rate. Uh, so with this scenario, in 2018, in order to stabilize the, 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 the debt at 75%, would need a fiscal surplus of 2% of GDP, a primary surplus, that is. Uh, here, we have a more benign scenario, the expected growth rate. This is expected by the, the independent financial institution, independent fiscal institution, I'm sorry. Uh, they're expecting a, a growth rate for 2018 of 2.7%. Just today, the IMF renew, uh, reviewed its, its measure, its expectation of, of growth for Brazil to 2.3%. Okay, for 2018. And here I have three different real interest rates based on NTB and NTNB, which is a, a federal security index to inflation. Okay. Uh, the minimum rate that is paid on this on this kind of security is 4.2, and the maximum is 5.2. And the neutral rate again is 5. So if we make this calculation we get an average required surplus. This is a bit more benign scenario than we have above here. It's uh, a primary surplus of 1.5. Uh, just to give you an idea of how, it doesn't mean much, it doesn't seem much, but just to give, a, to give an idea of how far we are from this. The fiscal target for 2018 is 159 billion of reais in deficits. In a deficit. That's the target. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which which is uh, more or less 2.3 percent of GDP in the negative side. So in order to um, to make up for for the fiscal effort needed to stabilize the the, the debt at 75 percent, would would need to cover this 2.3 percent of this that we already have, plus this average. So it's a lot. Mission impossible. Mission impossible, exactly. <laughs> Mission impossible. With this kind of revenue, forget it. And so, I think it's the, the uh, so we have some hard facts about the the, the the fiscal condition of Brazil that will have to be faced by whoever wins the election. Okay. The hard fact is that we have a growth of obligatory expenditures, especially um, social security. The social security uh, system will have to be reformed. Which reform, how, and in how many steps? It's, up for, it's all up for discussion. But it's not a matter of opinion anymore if we need to, to make a, a fiscal reform, uh, um, a social security reform. It's a, it's a matter of unpleasant arithmetic. It's simply, it the, the numbers don't add up. Just to give you an, uh, an idea, um, uh, the population over 65 will grow, will have increased by between 2015 and 2060 by 263 percent. That's numbers by the BGA. Um, 
And the, the working age population, which is between 14 and, and 60, is going to shrink by 7%. So, I mean, nowadays we have eight people um, of working age for each, for, for each person over 65. Now, a few years from now, we'll have less and less. And that's not working. Uh, if you count the, the working, who is working? I think now we have, uh, because unemployment is very, very high as well, we have, we have about two working for each one. That's. Uh, surviving on social security. This account cannot, you know, you, you have to change that. As you say, unpleasant arithmetic. It is. <laughs> Sergeant said that and the birth rate, in another context. And the birth rate is declining. And the birth rate, yeah. The, the fecundity rate is now only 1.7, which is below the position of the population. Okay. You below need, zero you, population. Yeah. Right. So it's. Uh, you have, it's just some pleasant arithmetic. You have to change the system. There's no way out. How you're going to do it, it's a matter of discussion, but you have to do it. Big challenge for the next government. For the next, yeah. exactly, exactly. And finally, the, the Constitutional Amen Amendment of 95, 95, number 95 of 2016, which is the, the expenditure rule I was talking about. This is going to be a big mess around already in 2019. And why is that so? Because uh, the, the, the rule says that if the expenditures cannot grow more than inflation, the past inflation, right? The problem is that expenditures on Social Security and payroll have been growing faster than inflation for a while and will continue to be growing. Mainly, if you don't if you don't change the social security, which the government um, kind of abandoned the proposal because he couldn't get support to to approve the reform. So, uh, for for this year, for 2018, the uh, the fiscal targets are going to be met with some kind of uh, room. <coughs> Uh, because there was a, a very strong fiscal rest restraint, uh, restraint and um, and the extraordinary revenues that, that were possible this year that will not be they're not recurrent. That means next year they will not they are not going to have this extra this extra revenues. This uh, is mainly privatizations. Yeah, privatizations and other revenues. Three minutes and that is my last. And so, so uh, the constitutional amendment here. Uh, if you, if you, the, the, the inflation that's predicted for 2019, the first year of the the, the new government, is 3.3 percent, which means that the, the expenditures will, will be able to be increased by 3.3 percent. And expenditures by Social Security, if everything stays as it is, is going to increase by 6.1%, and payroll by another 6%. So only that, you already blew out the ceiling. The other thing, one, one last thing that is interesting that's going on, because of the cap that this, this legislation put on expenditures, now the movement in Congress has been not to, to um, put items in the budget law, but to get fiscal breaks. They're working on the, the revenue side, because on the expenditure side, they cannot, they cannot do anything about it because of this law. So they're working on the revenue side. And there's like a bomb, a fiscal bomb, mm -hmm. on, the, on the making. Uh, the, the, the international uh, the independent fiscal institution uh, made a, a rough calculation, a, a primary calculation, and is expected to, to have an impact of over 200,000 uh, billions of reais. The, the, the depth to what we had already, the target is 159 billion of reais. And they are expecting a shock of 2,000 billion. So, I mean, we're really in for a bumpy ride. And I see, I see like, uh, we saw the 1980s as the, the, the decade of inflation, and inflation was the, 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 the main topic. 
the, the, the 2020s is going to be the decade of fiscal problems. We're going to be dealing with this fiscal problem for, unfortunately, a long time. That's it. Thank you, India. Okay, let me, let me thank all three of our presenters for interesting, I don't know that the word is complimentary. I mean, they do give us a picture uh, that the, the, the politics sounds awfully, uh, an awful lot like politics as usual from about 40 years ago, uh, <laughs> where we're focusing on clientelism, uh, Georgie's uh, treatment of Bahia, where uh, if, we, if we stop, and if we think of Georgie's maps, uh, where you have the PT strong in the south uh, in uh, 2002, uh, and uh, by 2006, it had strengthened in uh, the northeast, uh, and that continued. Uh, essentially, the PT that we saw as a, uh, as a kind of ideological new party had joined the clientelistic parties of the Northeast and gone native in, in the Northeast, a very interesting uh, pattern that we see here. Uh, and so all of that focuses on politics, but then whoever it is who gets elected, what do they do with the deficit and the, uh, the funding problem that Viviani's pointed to? So we have a lot to think about, uh, this being uh, builder practice, the time, uh, and then uh, the uh, speakers will address them, and then uh, we'll take three more. So uh, the floor is open for questions, comments, but if there are comments, very brief. Uh, is everybody so stunned that there are no comments? Yeah, and I'm going to ask you to, as you ask questions, to identify yourself. Uh, go ahead. My name is Lou. Uh, what I would like to find out is, well, basically it's, it's a question like, who wants to be president in this particular uh, <laughs> yeah. that you I have? I ask myself. You usually you get a lot of people who want to when you have something to embezzle. There, there, there really isn't much. So my question really is, <laughs> if Lula is having a problem because of corruption and the way everybody speaks and what I have read, most of the people who have been in Brazilian politics are corrupt, the same as ours are. I mean, you have to put everybody on the table. If you don't allow Lula to become a candidate, would there be a, uh, how, how do you say, a back, uh, um, uh, backlash? Yes, a backlash, thank you, for, uh, uh, of the, I don't know what class, I would imagine the lower to middle class, uh, because the PT, I don't think, are um, uh, wealthy people. I would imagine they're more like uh, transitionary workers. So if it boils down to that, why not let him hold the bag and see what he can do? So my question is, why is this, uh, everybody taking Lula's votes when I feel that he is going to be able to run because of an equality of everybody being corrupt as an equal? Uh, let me add one amendment to it uh, when you come to answering that question, and that is, is there any likelihood that Lula will be found in a higher appeal uh, not guilty, uh, which would then enable him to run? That's just an amendment to Lou's question. And, uh, and, and Bob, uh, you're next to identify yourself. My name is Bob Coulson. So, yeah, but great Brazilian is. <laughs> no, not so uh, I thought these were great presentations, I, so thank you very much. I, so just a comment on Lula running. Lula running is, reminds me a little bit after Viviani's presentation of um, Carlos Andres Paris, uh, the second coming, uh, in which um, the second everybody coming, expected yeah. the good times to return. Mm -hmm. And when he got to office, he he did an about face, a very radical about face, which had a devastating impact on the, um, the legitimacy of the Venezuelan system and did a lot to pave the way for, um, uh, for uh, Chavez. I don't know that this would be the same film, but um, 
I, you know, it has it has really interesting implications. Well, I'm not sure that he will run. I, I think he probably will. My guess is he won't. Mm -hmm. um, so, but my question, I have a question for both Georgie and, and for Vianney. Georgie, you, you know, you, you, you emphasize the fact that the PT is going to survive, but in a, 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 as Ken said, in a much diminished form. And it just, it seems to me, or my question is, is the PT ever to have any chance of, of coming back as a major party, national party? And for Viviani, um, uh, is there going to be a debt crisis again in Brazil? I mean, um, it, you're right that this is unsustainable, mm -hmm. except we know it's unsustainable only after, you know, yeah. Countries blow through the whatever constraints, and then people won't lend to them anymore. Right. So, what's your guess as to if and when Brazil falls out of the international uh, lending you know, credit system? Thank you, Bob. A question from over on this side next. To yes, please. Uh, Identify yourself. Uh, my name is Leandro. So I have a couple of questions, one for David and Georgie, and the other one for uh, Viviani. Uh, my first question is, uh, I know that in, your pres uh, in George's presentation, he said that there isn't really much of an answer to this question, but I would like to have uh, the personal opinion of, of both of you on what the forecast for the, for the next election would be. Uh, we know that up until a few months ago, uh, most specialists would, or at least the polls would point to, to be between Bolsonaro and Lula, which is not a very likely scenario at this point for very obvious reasons. Uh, and my question to Viviani would be, uh, what's her take in, in, the, in the recent uh, budget reasons on uh, education and health that have recently been mm -hmm. passed? Uh, that, that were passed last year in Congress. Do you think that uh, this is going to be uh, uh, beneficial in the long term? Do you think this is going to increase uh, economic inequality? I would like to have what your take is on, on uh, such legislation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now let us uh, give each of you the opportunity in the order that you presented. So David, uh, uh, pick up first, then Georgie, then Vivian. Well, regarding the first question about Lula, and he uh, having been put in jail and prosecuted for cat corruption accusations, uh, probably the next level court, the STJ, would maintain his conviction because they have already denied uh, obvious corpus for him twice already. Uh, however, in mid-September, Giustofoli, who is a, a, a dyed-in-the-wool Petista, will assume the presidency of the Supreme Court. So that would be about uh, 20 days before the election. So no one knows what he would do as, as the next president of the Supreme Court. Many people feel that Lula was singled out uh, to be prosecuted and put in jail, but the Brazilians will tell you that that's the rule of the current laws and no one is above the law in Brazil. <laughs> Americans are trying to tell that about Trump, that, exactly. Exactly. that Trump thinks he's above any law. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, but uh, Lava Jato has put a lot of other people in jail, not only Petitas, but people from the PMDB, from the PDT, from PR, and some 14 different parties that have been under prosecution with the, the, the Lava Jato. However, proportionately, there are more P PT types uh, having been prosecuted and convicted uh, in these corruption uh, scandals. As you know, uh, this whole episode more or less destroyed Petrobras, our largest corporation in Brazil, and is now in the process of being re recovered or recuperated. Uh, many people here in the U.S. bought shares in Petrobras and are now were in a uh, class action suit to recover their losses. That's been more or less settled out of court here in the New York District Court. And as you know, the New York District Court here is pretty violent. They're the ones that went after Michael Cohen the other day. 
And so uh, my own personal feeling is that Lula was the mastermind of this whole corruption scandal ever since the Mensa loan, and that uh, he, as the mastermind, uh, came under uh, prosecution and, and was convicted. Now, he has, I think, five or six other cases of accusations under deliberation in courts in Curitiba, in Sao Paulo, and also in Brazil for other types of bribery cases and corruption cases. The big, another big change is with the Swiss government. The Swiss government opened up all of its secret bank accounts and allowed Brazil to look at all this bribe money that had been scurried away in, in secret bank accounts in, uh, in Switzerland, which was a, a huge change, a really big change. About the debt, debt crisis, and is Brazil going to slip back into the, the debt crisis of the 1980s or not? Brazil is trying very desperately to get into the OECD. And uh, the OECD is looking at Brazil, as Brazil has fulfilled, I don't know, four or five or six criteria so far, but they have another 20 or 30 that they're not going to be able to, to meet. So that's uh, another uh, problem. Yeah, but you didn't answer the question that you were uh, saying about the Swiss bank accounts. What did they find? Did they find anything from Lula or not? Because as you explain about his position in relationship to Brazil, whatever he has done, he's getting a popular base. And if I understood you correctly, he had 39% uh, of the vote. He went down to 31, and everybody else was taking his uh, share. But his share of popularity, I would imagine, as it gets more and more tense, will become higher and higher. Yeah, many people in Brazil say uh, Lula is a national icon. Yes. And having been arrested in prison, from an icon, he turns into a martyr. Exactly. But no one has found any specific exactly. Lula money in Swiss Very bank well. accounts or any other places. But this money was distributed in other types of things. The first, con the first conviction was OAS, the construction company, had gotten a lot of favors mm -hmm. within Petrobras for construction <laughs> contracts and the, the bribes were this huge apartment building in, in Guarujá, in, in Rio. And Lula was designated to receive the top floors, top three floors of a triplex apartment. Uh, you could have bought that from Trump, too? Yes, but... Uh, Let David uh, give his answer, yeah, please. But then other types of bribes and resources were channeled to other people related to Lula, to his, his Lula Institute, and he has a... a, a a corporation or a business for his speaking engagements, and the speaking engagements receive millions and millions of reais, and many people doubt what types of speaking engagements he engaged in, and some of the, the funds were channeled to his sons as well. So Lula was quite careful into where these funds were channeled, uh, but as as Jorge, as Jorge explained, uh, the PT and Lula's base in the Northeast is still very strong. He didn't mention it, but it's mostly based on Bolsa Familia, which is a family stipend that existed already within Cardozo's government, but was very small. And so Lula increased this as of 2003 uh, to, to include maybe 14 million families, and most of those families in the Northeast. We have some very good research done by Timothy Power and Wendy Hunter, both in the 2006 and the 2010 election, which correlates the percentage of the, of the PT vote with the percentage of Bolsa Familia in that municipality. And the correlation is extremely high, as you might imagine. So there, there are other reasons why Lula and the PT have been so strong in the Northeast. Lula was born in the Northeast. He's a, uh, a son of the Northeast region in, in Pernambuco, and his family went to Sao Paulo in what's called a Pau de Arara, a truck transporting people, migrants, to, to Sao Paulo with his mother and his, and his brothers and sisters. Uh, and so he is Brazil's first poor president who does not even have a fifth grade education and got, worked his way up through the labor union movement. And Brazil never before had a president from the lower classes, so which is quite exceptional. But I don't think he's going to be a candidate this year. And the big question is who's going to transfer his votes. In the poll, it showed that 23% are going to be, have said they're not going to vote at all. They're going to vote null or blank. And that's uh, maybe half of where 
Lula's votes are going to go. Ciro uh, Gomes thinks he's going to get it all, and that they're going to do a PT will do a coalition with with the, with the PDT and and Ciro Gomes. But the large majority of the PT leaders don't like Ciro Gomes at all, and they don't think that's ever going to happen. But this is a big question for 2018. Where are these Lula voters going to go? And we'll have to wait and see. The problem is we have, as you mentioned before, this polarization between left, Lula, and Bolsonaro on the right. And we didn't have any candidate, which you would call a strong candidate in the center, which we had, we had always had before. Alchemy is not going to make it, whether the PSDB is going to put John Doughty into being their candidate or not. We don't know whether Cesar Maya, uh, Rodrigo Maya will become a strong center candidate or not. But Barbosa, if he gets together in a coalition with Marina Silva, they might be a strong center, center type slate. We don't know. So the, the whole election thing is very much up in the air. We don't really know what's going to happen. <laughs> Remember, uh, nobody, almost nobody thought Trump was going to be elected president. Yeah. Uh, right up to uh, not even Trump himself to, to <laughs> James Comey's uh, ultimate intervention in the election. Georgie, did you want to use the Can microphone? I, I, I want to actually use a, a graphic here real quick, if Go I ahead. could. Um, thank you for the questions. Um, let me just let me try to see if I can go in order here. Um, So before we get to this, um, who's going to want to be president when there's no money to, to, to distribute around? There's always someone to distribute. <laughs> Even when you don't have enough money or when you're a shortage and you can't make it rain, there's still cracks and there's still loopholes. And, and that happened through the debt crisis. That happened through the lost decade. That happened all the time. There's time. And also, um, I was a little depressed when, when Ken reacted to what I said and then what Bob said as well. Um, I guess I sound a lot worse than I think in my head with the story that I'm showing. <laughs> I have an ingrained kind of <laughs> type of bias for hope. I don't think Brazil is what it was 40 years ago. It's been absolute I boy. think <laughs> the consolidation of democracy, even though democracy is, you know, probably slightly deconsolidating right now, um, has increased, let's say, programmatic politics, even within the story of corruption. It's really, really hard to get people to believe that. But I think both of those things can be true. Um, I think, you know, the, the PT and, the, and the, the former PFL and the party on the right are fighting in Bahia, but, but I think people in Bahia are getting more public goods than they used to. I think most of those things can be true. I think there's still a lot of jockeying and politicaging and channeling resources here and there, but um, I slightly disagree with the emphasis of what David said. I mean, yes, in the Northeast, people reward Lula, but they reward Lula for, for a policy that's been proven by scholarship, that's programmatic, right? There's no local control or capture of Bolsa Familia. I mean, what's the difference between, oh, this is clientelistic, or it's just, I'm just rewarding somebody who gave me a public good when nobody did before. I think both of these things can be happening, right? I mean, there is a strong correlation, yes, but I think research by Wendy Hunter also has shown, and other people, Cesar Zucco, and have shown that, that most of these attachments are programmatic, even though you know they are also attached to the person of Lula. Um, so who wants to run? Everybody still does. And, and you know, it's going to be some hard times, but people find ways. And sometimes people run because they, not because they want to stuff their pockets. That's just secondary. Um, is there going to be a backlash if Lula doesn't run? So Datafora, which is one of the main um, opinion poll um, places who does that, you know, they also do the, 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 you know, the intentions, voting intentions. They ask two questions. Was Lula's imprisonment unfair? And a majority of the population actually think it was fair. Now, the problem is a large chunk also think it was unfair. And those people are going to be very, very upset, right? Um, most people actually think that Lula won't run, even though the PT said that there is no plan B, even to this day, right? Um, the president of the PT, the party, to the last day said, you know, this week said, there is no alternative to Lula. Lula is our ticket. It would be dumb, her words, right? It would be dumb to run anybody else. But Lula is, you know, is uh, the political power, the political force. Um, so there is I no other, there there is no other candidate, right? <laughs> I mean, especially because the PT is also not, you know, 
They're not mosquitoes in there. So it, it's not just happening to them. Hold on. Where is the... I don't know what's happening. The, the timekeeper says we need to be concise. Sorry, 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 Will the PT ever be a strong party again? Um, I think if Lula can run and win the presidency, my argument kind of goes that if they can recapture the presidency, then yes. If Lula can't run, and that's why some people on the left think that that's why they went after Lula, is to prevent this last chance to grab it. And I think if they can't grab it, I don't think they can do it anymore. I think they'll be kind of a middle of the ground, kind of not a small party anymore, but not big. But if they could take it right now, I think they can reclaim it. But that's why everybody cares very deeply about Lula not being able to run. Um, would I guess who's going to win? Absolutely not, Leandro, sorry. Um, I think some people say that the, the institutional advantages of people like Alchemy, for example, they have Fundo Partidario and they have time on TV, so they'll do better than they're doing right now. But that's as far as I'll go. I, I, I wouldn't guess to, if, if my life depended on it, I, I, I wouldn't gamble. <laughs> sorry, I would not. Just one comment. The PT has never had any other candidate except Lula. Lula chose Juma as his personal stand-in. But right now, they have no other alternative. They have no other candidate they could run. None. Zero. Viviani's chance. And uh, take this mic, Viviani. There were, there were like two questions, right? Uh, the first one is about the debt, when it's going to happen. Well, Brazil has been downgraded already by two or three uh, credit agents, agencies. And we are about two notches from being considered junk. <laughs> so um, the thing is, the, the debt by itself is not that high. 80%, 85% uh, OECD countries have a much larger debt over GDP. The problem is not as much the level of the debt that we have now, but the trajectory and how it's being financed. I didn't get into details of that, but we have like 73% of the debt is indexed. And it's a, that's a big it's problem. Debt or no, the domestic, mm -hmm. domestic debt. And so, I mean, we're already paying a price for, for this fiscal situation because with these credit ratings abroad, the Brazilian um, companies are already facing a higher um, interest, interest higher interest rates abroad. So we're already paying uh, a price for that. And uh, you asked a difficult question, if, when it's going to bust, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to duck the question, but the, uh, there, there are several ways of busting, right? Uh, we broke once already in the, in the uh, 1990, right? the, the domestic debt. Um, uh, and we blow it through inflation. I think now the central bank is much more equipped to prevent that from happening. But we have actually some uh, uh, interesting changes in the legislation between the, uh, that regulates how the treasury and the central bank uh, relate to one another and how transfers are made um, from um, non-realized revenues that the central bank makes with uh, when you have changed in the value of the reserves, of international reserves, uh, you have a, for example, if you have a, a profit from that, the central bank has to transfer that amount of money, even if it doesn't realize the profit, it, if it doesn't sell the, the currency. It has to transfer that, um, that profit to the treasury um, directly and um, in the same month. Why, when the opposite happens, if the, the central bank has a loss, which is not realized as well. The, 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 the treasury just issues uh, securities and gives to the central bank, and it has six months to do that. So we have an, a kind of a symmetry uh, between the transfers that actually helps the treasury. And uh, it becomes more fragile, the position of the central bank and the budget itself becomes more fragile because of this. I think that they should promote a change in this kind of regulation. But having said that, 
the, the, the institution, the fiscal the, the institutions uh, in the country have been working, uh, have been strong and working. So I don't think we're going to have, um, I mean, we are already broke. <laughs> Fiscally. Fiscally broke. We're yes. broke. <laughs> but the, the government has been able to finance its debt. Um, and I think it will continue to be able, because it's, it's financially interesting to um, invest in, in, tre in treasury bonds in Brazil. And we have some, some uh, you don't have any long-term uh, any long any long term form of investment in Brazil. The only thing that you have is the, the treasury bonds, which are not that long either. But that's the only thing available. So a lot of private pensions uh, funds investing in in Brazilian securities domestically. So they are kind of a secured market for the the, the secure for the treasury securities. Um, so I don't think we're going to to uh, bust in the regular way that we have in mind, you know, oh, it's, no, it's, it's closed the market for Brazilian securities. I don't think that's going to happen. What's happening already is that we, we see that the rating is going down and uh, the, the price of our credit, uh, of credit for Brazilians are going up. And that's what we, have, we already have. But I don't think we'll have the regular, either inflationary bust or uh, upfront uh, the fall. I don't think so. We'll take one more series. Uh, let, me, uh, okay. let me ask. There was a question over here about education and health. Oh yeah, I forgot. Uh, I forgot. Because our inflation rate is extremely low. The last twelve months is about two point five percent. That means that the, the the budget for two thousand nineteen can only expand two point five. Mm -hmm. But as she explained, you have these increases in, in, in sal federal salaries and also especially in Social Security. So where is the crunch? If you're going to have an increase in Social Security and, and salaries, you're going to have to cut somewhere. And, and many people are fearful that they're going to cut education and health, mm -hmm. which are areas that have a natural expansion. In the health, you never know what's going to happen, whether you're going to have an epidemic, you're going to have whatever. And so we're very fearful that in the next budget for 2019, both education and health are going to suffer uh, and have their, their expenditures uh, reduced, unfortunately. I just, let me just okay. So Vivian, do you want to add? add? Yes, I want Go to add ahead. to this, because he asked me this question and I forgot to mention. But the thing is, the, the, the Constitutional Amendment 95 uh, includes the, the part of the expenditure in health and education that's uh, custeo, which is operational. Most of, most of the, of the uh, expenditures in education, it's outside of this, of this cap. Because right. it's well, done by the, the state. Only, only for the first year, not for 2019. No, yes. Yeah. But most of it is, is, is from, from the states. So now we will take questions. And you had your hand up. It would have been fourth, so you're first in this round. Go ahead, stand up, identify yourself. Year. But, but not so people can hear you back there. My name is Matthew Mead. I'm a retired faculty member at the City University yeah. of New York, the economist. So I'd like to ask a couple of questions on economics. Uh, my understanding is that the, uh, the new government will come in facing dire times uh, and uh, possibly institute some kind of uh, reduction program in terms of spend, spending, expenditures and benefits. Uh, for um, folks, uh, my first question is: uh, What about what is the what is the taxing possibility? Taxing the uh, policies are in fact is there any sort of like history of actually having raised taxes progressively uh, in order to uh, reduce this uh, this budget? I also was filming at the time, so I'm not quite sure uh, exactly what was the big jump in the uh, deficit. Uh, what there was the uh, reason for it, but much more concerned about uh, whether or not uh, there's going to be any real taxing, uh, tax in in incentives uh, progressively to uh, increase taxes, again, on the wealthier people so that uh, the uh, programs don't have to be reduced uh, significantly. Also, whether or not uh, Brazil's economy is sufficient 
such that it can uh, invest in other areas to provide the kind of uh, revenue growth that might also uh, be uh, important in, in reducing the, uh, uh, the, the deficit. And of course, the rate of time uh, of that reduction of the deficit. And there was a question also about uh, possibly reduction of uh, school. Brazil has, unlike the United States at the present, to a certain extent, uh, free tuition at uh, its universities. And so is there going to be this big mix, uh, change in mix, in other words, much more private uh, institutions, which of course then become the big problem, and reduction in the, the, uh, of the state and, well, especially the federal university, uh, which in fact uh, our tuition be. Um, that, you, you've hit three that. questions okay. already, and yeah. I've got to move on to, to others. Thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, a question back here. Brief, concise, please. Uh, say it louder. Yanis Delegatis, Henry George School of Social Science. Uh, one question is on the democratic nature of debt. Uh, to me, it's not democratic to, to load a next generation on, uh, on, on today. <laughs> so would you see, has anybody thought of putting clauses of debt to be honored or dishonored, like in, in due time with referenda and stuff like that? That's number one. Number two, has, is Brazil facing brain drain, and have there been any thoughts of uh, using global income taxation to possibly tap uh, profits that have been generated in Brazil and then they've been outsourced uh, elsewhere? Uh, is there any thought on taxing on based on global income? Thank you. Question, uh, last, go ahead. Ali Johnson, uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Do you feel that, uh, since David started us off talking about Lula as the mastermind of the mental Island and of the corruption scandals. Do you think um, President Dilma was fairly impeached in 2016? And do you think there's a perspective for political reform in the short term future? Okay, those are the three. Uh, Just last short, short question. Short. Go ahead. Just the question in how far you think that China will play a role with regard to the debt? And in general, the whole political process to come. China. OK, question. now let's run it in reverse. So Viviana, you can go first in this round of, of responses. Uh, the question about tax, mm. the possibility. Take the mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, the possibility of taxing, right? Of progressive, progressive tax. Uh, the, the tax burden in Brazil is about 32% now. And it's the highest in Latin America. We're just uh, the second highest, I'm sorry. We're just behind uh, Argentina. Uh, in Latin America, it's, about, it's around 22% the tax burden. So we have a high tax burden for a middle-income country. That's one thing. Uh, but, but the Brazilian system, taxing system, does, have, does not have a problem generating revenues. Does not have a problem with that. It's being able to increase revenues over, over time several times. Uh, but it relies heavily on taxing production. And the industry, particularly the industry, and the industry sector is kind uh, of shrinking. Is that a bad tax you're talking about? Is that what? Bad, value added tax. No, no we don't, we have, don't, a have, value, we don't have a value added Not yet. tax. <laughs> we should have one. <laughs> but the, 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 uh, the Federalist uh, Agreement that you need because of the, the states have particular test, uh, tax, uh, special tests, the, the ESMES, um, and they'll, they'll have to, sales some tax. sales taxes, yeah. Some of them will lose revenues from changing from ESMES, from sales tax to a, a value added tax. So it's very difficult to reach an agreement on how to implement that, okay? There's a tax, uh, tax reform proposal sitting in Congress for more than 10 years and we don't move. Okay. Uh, but the thing is, with this, with this law, the expenditure rule, uh, there was a, a one, benefit, one benefit of the rule was that it made, the, it made Brazilians realize what a budget is, what a restriction, financial restriction means. Because before that, if you need an, an extra expenditure item, you would just add it and find the revenue later on. And now with this, with this rule, we have to face a budget restriction. 
money is not endless, right? <laughs> so we have to face that. That was a good thing about it. The bad thing about it, in my view, is that it, it kind of uh, closed the it closed the discussion. It put uh, uh, it closed the discussion on improving or changing the tax system. Because if it focused on expenditures, which had to do it, it had to, it had to focus on, on controlling expenditures. As I show you, it's, it's, it's being increasing too fast for too long. Um, and, but focusing on expenditures only, it, it closed the discussion on, on revenues. And so even if, just to answer your question, even, even if, you, if you have more revenues, uh, you still have to follow the, budget, the, the, the expenditure rule of increasing expenditures only to the amount of past inflation. You understand? Even if you have more revenues. So uh, programs will have to be cut mm -hmm. and taxes will have to be increased. There's not one solution to the fiscal problem. You know, there'll, there'll have to be, you have to be like, it's a multi-vectorial uh, solution. You, you need things from the revenue side, you need institutional change, mm. and, and you need also uh, 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 reforms, social security reform is, is a must. Thank you, and investment, oh. an investment for growth, the possibility of investing, that's one area. All the, the, the states, the local, the local governments, the lower level of government, have been uh, uh, constraining expenditures a lot since the last crisis. And actually, they were able to, get, to have some primary surplus, surplus, the states together, um, but at expenses of cutting investment. And there's a limit that you can cut investment. So already in 2017, expenditures start to grow again on the state level. Okay? This, will, this bill will end up at the federal level, for sure. That's another shock, a, a fiscal risk that we're going to have, we're going to face. Probably the next government, the, the next, next president will face that shock again. And, uh, and, and investment for growing, we need investment in infrastructure. There's a lot of bottlenecks in Brazil. A lot of, and you either have some uh, uh, private, uh, public-private partnership, or we, you're not going to, the government will not have money for, for investment. It's already very low. You know, infrastructure investment in Brazil, according to BNDES, is about 2%. Uh, the government itself, when it was the highest, was 1.5% of GDP investment. And it's been cut and cut and cut because of this, of this law. So what I think is going to happen is that the law is going to fall. <laughs> That's what I think is going to happen. That's possible. <laughs> that may be the easy way up. That's going to be the Georgie, way Georgie, next. I will be super quick. So um, I'm going to focus on the two questions that I, can, I think I can say something about. So was Juma fairly impeached? I think that's the... I think that's a question that comes from the heart, but from a, from a matter of people who study impeachments, I don't think that matters. I think it's, there's people who are more guilty who have not been impeached, and there's people who are less guilty who have been impeached. I think the people who study impeachment say what matters are the conditions around it. And if you have a perfect storm, um, you know, economic recession, public protests, the media jumps on it, and then eventually the, 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 the president loses support of, of Congress. That's when it happens. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if, if it's fair or unfair. Could other people have done it? Sure. But the people who studied back when Collar was impeached before or, or other people in Venezuela and other places, it's a matter of when this perfect, imperfect storm of conditions happens. Um, that's when impeachments happen. I mean, in part, is the petitive blame? Sure. Did they fiddle around with the books a little bit? Sure. Everybody does it. But they also made their bed with opportunists who would turn on them. Right? They got in cahoots with the Pemi de Bay, with the Pepe, with a bunch of people that before they didn't mix with. If they had stick to their stuck to their ideology partners in the left, that probably wouldn't have happened to them. But what brought them to power also cost them power. So, so I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's fair or unfair. I mean, it might be unsatisfying, but the, the way that you can understand it is it's the imperfect storm of conditions. Some of them they caused, other things that they didn't cause. 
And then, do you think that there could be, do I think there could be political reform? So, I think it's unlikely. People who say that people who get elected have political capital and then push, you know, Gerald Lockney said this this week, like, oh yeah, you know, you gotta use your political capital to then push reforms. Okay, maybe. Um, but then the other thing is because of campaign reform, you're not gonna get new faces. You gotta get the same old faces. Because of campaign reform, only the old names are gonna have money to run campaigns. So you're gonna have the people who have no vested, I mean, they have vested interests, so they don't wanna reform. Um, so I think political reform is gonna be one of those things where everybody agrees that they want them, but it's just gonna keep pushing back and kicking the can, right? Impujando con barriga. David, you're next. But, okay. but let me make one comment. Uh, since Georgie brought up reform, one of my, my notes here was that the term reform had been used by all of you in one context or another, <laughs> but it's clear you weren't talking, that the word didn't mean the same thing in each of these contexts. David, go ahead. Well, political reforms are a never-ending story in Brazil. Uh, last year, we did have two minor changes in what we'd call political reform. Brazil has been looking at a possible exclusion clause, like Germany has, 5%. You don't get 5% of the vote, you don't elect anybody. That's the way it works in Germany. But the only thing that Congress produced last year was a exclusion clause saying that in the 2018 elections, if you don't get 1.5% of the popular vote, you're not going to have any access to free TV propaganda time, nor are you going to have any access to the party fund. That will kill any small party. They also approved for, but for the 2020 elections and 2022 elections that to prohibit any co uh, election coalitions among parties to elect deputies, proportional elections. That, if that is sustained, that would be a major change in political reform. But the other political reform proposals were, were not viable in Congress last year. Juma's impeachment, fair or unfair? No one has looked at or, or complained about Caller's impeachment back in 92. Was that fair or unfair? But when the Senate got around to voting on Juma's impeachment, everyone wanted to see what Senator Caller's vote would be and how he would describe his vote. At first, everyone thought he was going to vote in favor of Juma. But then he said, she didn't listen to me, the voice of experience. I was impeached because I neglected Congress. She was impeached because she also neglected Congress. And I told her three or four times, you better shape up your game and not neglect Congress anymore. You're going to be in trouble. That was how Caller described the situation. So yes, yeah, she lost her majority in Congress. One PT deputy said, I've been in here eight years in Congress. Yesterday was the first time she ever called me on the phone, for example. And PT was her party, you see. So she neglected Congress and she had some peccadillos, yes. But when you lose a large section of support in Congress, you become vulnerable to being impeached. New investments, new pri private sector investments, who are now at about maybe 16% of GDP in new investments. If Brazil's going to grow anything, maybe 2 or 3%, you're going to need at least 22% of GDP new investments each year. Well, what happened? Lula was very, very favorable to the international community and finance, uh, domestic and international. And Brazil received a lot of investments. So with Juma, they began to dry up. So these, especially foreign investors, said, great, you got rid of Juma. But now we want to wait and see. What are you going to do? The new president, can he do any reforms? We're going to wait and see. These people are still waiting to see. No reforms. Uh, so that's a big problem. Brain drain. Brazil has lost a lot of middle class and upper middle class families who just say, we can't take it anymore, we're leaving. U.S., Canada, uh, Portugal, Australia, etc. So yes, we are having some sort, some a part of a, of a brain drain. Uh, taxation. We've been looking at tax reform for a long time, but Juma did the opposite. She did what we call tax incentives to certain, certain, certain very specific sectors of industry. We're going to give you this tax incentive where you're going to pay less taxes, but you're going to have to do this, this, and this to employ more people and innovate and all that. But they didn't do anything, but they got this free load of tax ex exemptions. So that's what you call negative uh, problems with taxation. Our other big problem with taxation is tax evasion. We have tremendous tax evasion, especially from, from, the, from the private sector, and these people pay off the deputies so they don't give the income tax service more power. 
to, to combat tax evasion. Unfortunately, that's a very sad story. So the people tell us that with, because of tax evasion, we lose between 40 and 50 percent of the taxes that Brazil could collect if we didn't have tax evasion. China, very good question. The U.S. more or less took Latin America off the screen as of Clinton. Worse with Bush and, uh, uh, of course, uh, now with uh, Obama, et cetera. So who, who moved in to take up the slack, the, va the vacuum? China. China moved into Latin America with all sorts of investments and loan programs and other things. China's moved into Brazil really, really fast and is into the uh, public uh, services area, especially electricity. New transmission lines. Mostly Chinese firms have gotten the, the bidding and the contracts to do this. They bought several hydroelectric projects as well in Brazil and even electricity distribution private companies. So yes, China is, is, is big in Brazil and is also big in a lot of other Latin American countries as well. Thank you, David. Do you expect they will export soybeans? Oh yes, soy. Uh, Brazilian soybean producers are very, very happy because Trump, Trump is putting all these tariffs on China and China's gonna retaliate and tax U.S. soybeans 25%. So it's going to increase the supply, the export of Brazilian soybeans to China. It's going to increase the price of soybeans in Brazil. <laughs> we're yes. over our, our time limit, but we're going to, in good Brazilian fashion, exceed it. Uh, so, so we will take a couple more questions. Hey, until they kick us out, right? <laughs> yes. I'm wondering if anybody can comment on what will be the role of the military Oh, I hope none. Uh, so one question about the military, and that, in fact, the military came up several times in David's presentation. So uh, one other quick question. Okay, that's it. Predictions. 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 Predictions for what? They. They already avoided the, the predictions. No, uh, and so I predict that Brazil is going to win the World Cup. That's what I predict. No, I don't predict that hope. <laughs> so, well, the, the military is involved in elections. Uh, we've had one military intervention that Temer decreed, an intervention into the Seguranza Pública, the public safety security sector in the state of Rio. And so a, a, a three-star general is now the Secretary of Public Safety and Security in Rio. Because of this intervention that the president made, the Constitution says during this intervention period, no constitutional amendments can be passed. So that's sort of a flimsy excuse why they haven't done any reform on Social Security reform, which is a constitutional amendment. We've had some very, let's say, difficult noises coming out of some retired generals saying that uh, if this situation really goes to hell, uh, we may have to intervene. But these are retired generals who are sort of isolated, but the, the commanders, who are active duty commanders of the three armed forces, have said no, no interference and nothing to do with the elections. This is your problem, you civilians, you, take, you, you resolve your problems. Uh, the armed forces generally, the ones who are older, remember very bitterly or very negatively the military intervention, which they claim uh, more or less destroyed their military institutions. And if the military regime of 21 years was very negative for the Brazilian military institutions. Finally, Cardoso was able to, as president, in 1999, impose a defense ministry and remove the three commanders who had ministerial cabinet status. There was a minister of the Army, minister of the Navy, minister of the Air Force. So they got reduced to being commandants. So Cardoso put in that reform, but Ever since Cardoso did this, the Minister of Defense has always been a civilian, okay? And occasionally a communist uh, <laughs> politician was a Minister of Defense, which the military thought was pretty good because they had some pretty nationalistic ideas, et cetera. But now Tamer, as the, perhaps the weakest president Brazil has had in a long, long time, uh, the defense minister left to become Minister of Public Safety and Security a new ministry. And so he put in an active duty general to be Minister of Defense, which many people thought was a pretty stupid thing to do, uh, or let's say politically stupid. And so we now have a military general who is the Minister of Defense. So if you want to look at involvement of the military in politics, that's a change. 
And then if I can just jump in here, I mean, even if they're not doing that actively, right? I mean, there's the, there's the thing that the military doesn't want to govern, but it, it's reserving itself the right to play a veto role. Um, the day that the Supreme Court was deciding stuff on Lula, you know, the, the head of the army went on Twitter, even though Timur doesn't tweet, the head of the military does. And they said, hey, we're, we're here with the Brazilian population and we're against corruption. And, and many people read that as saying, hey, Supreme Court, here's what I think you should do. Um, and very few people had the, the guts, the guts to, to say, you know what, the leader of the army shouldn't be doing this. Um, many people, you know, put their tail between their legs and, and kind of accepted that as kind of a veiled uh, veto role played by the army. So it was an scary. attempt to influence the Supreme Court. Yeah, so it's slightly scary, more than slightly scary. I think the scarier part is when you see a bunch of people with no institutional or historical knowledge um, say, hey, um, what we need is the army to come in here and clean this up. Um, I don't think the people of that generation of the armed forces believe that. No, they know how much it cost them, right? But, but some people... Yeah, the survey, oh, the survey research they, shows they've, they've that maybe 30% that. Percent want, want the military back in power. Yeah, people my age and younger like, are, are saying that stuff. I think they, they, don't know they should have gone to school to know a little better, but, but, but they didn't. See, we have a generation of what you hear in the people call the millennials, okay? We have people who are like, uh, who, 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 because we, we've, we ended the military regime 30, 33 years ago. So we have a younger population, say between 15 and 35, or 40, who don't really remember anything about the military regime at all. And so they don't really have an opinion or any idea what the, a military regime might mean for Brazil. And so as exactly this segment, of the younger segment of the population, that are in favor of military intervention. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, until it happens to them. <laughs> then they're going to wish they got it back. <laughs> okay, that's the last word. Let me thank Mauricio and the Bildner Center for organizing this very interesting panel. Thank the panelists for terrific presentations and for the Q&A and you, the audience, for your all you. enhancing everything too. Thank you.